In the previous video, we talked about functions, which took us back to things that we heard about in middle school, but with a few new twists. Well, in this video, we're going to go even further back to things that we learned about in elementary school and talk about properties of the integers. Now, before you decide that you already know about all of this, here's a list of the topics that we're going to cover in this video. I think it's interesting that some of these things are things that we teach kids to use from the time when they're very young and which most people probably never question for their entire lives. But the underlying mathematics and the proofs of even some of these basic results turns out to be a little more complicated than most people would probably expect. I'm going to start by talking about the principle of mathematical induction and the well-ordering principle. These are two principles which are easy to believe and which are closely related to each other, and I think most of you will be familiar with them. Now, I want to mention at the beginning that there is a little bit of disagreement, depending on who you talk to, about which of these results is more fundamental, and about whether or not one of them is stronger than the other, or whether or not they're essentially on equal ground. Well, I want to go ahead and answer that right now. There's more than one way to construct the integers as a mathematical object, starting from some collection of mathematical axioms. For example, in some axiomatic systems, the principle of mathematical induction is actually one of the things that you assume as an axiom at the beginning, and you later use it together with the other axioms to derive the well-ordering principle. On the other hand, there are ways of constructing the integers which seem to be independent of both of these principles, and then both principles can be deduced with essentially equal effort from the construction and the axioms which are assumed. That's the reason why I'm just going to say that these two principles are closely related to each other. But for the purposes of this presentation, we'll consider the principle of mathematical induction first, and we'll take it as an axiom that we can build upon. To state the principle of mathematical induction, suppose that for each positive integer n, s of n is a logical statement and that two things hold. Number one, s of one is true, and number two, for each positive integer n, if s of n is true, then s of n plus 1 is true. Under these assumptions, the principle of mathematical induction claims that s of n is true for all positive integers n. Now, when you first see this, you might question whether or not it is indeed a correct logical form of argument. But remember what I just said, that we're going to treat this principle as one of our axioms. In other words, we're going to assume that it is a correct form of logical argument. I can kind of sympathize with philosophical objections to the principle of mathematical induction, but it's a basic result that we need in order to get very far in mathematics, so we're just going to take it and run with it. Now I'd like to be a little more pragmatic and to introduce some language that we can refer to when we're using the principle of mathematical induction to prove things. So let's suppose that we're trying to prove some statement s of n is true for all natural numbers n and n. In order to do this using the principle of mathematical induction, First, we need to establish what's called the base case, which is the assertion that s of n is true when n is equal to 1. A lot of times this might turn out to be the easy part of the proof, but it can't be overlooked. Sometimes it's actually difficult, and sometimes it turns out to not be true. And I've seen at least one major instance where something like that has turned out to be the core error in a major mathematical proof. Once you've established that s of 1 is true, you can move on to the inductive step. In the inductive step, you want to prove the universal statement that for every positive integer n, if s of n is true, then s of n plus 1 is true. The assumption that s of n is true in this statement is known as what's called the inductive hypothesis. Once you've completed the inductive step, you can conclude based on the principle of mathematical induction that s of n is true for all natural numbers n. I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with the principle of mathematical induction, so I'm not going to go into detail giving a lot of examples in this video. It is pretty important though and it's going to come up again, both in this video and in later videos. There are a few modifications to the general recipe that I just showed you, and I'd like to discuss those because they come up pretty often. First of all, it may be the case that the statement s of n that you want to prove isn't naturally written as a statement about the collection of all natural numbers, but about the collection of all numbers greater than or equal to some integer b. Well, of course, it's not difficult to see that in this case you could have rewritten your problem as a statement about the natural numbers just by translating everything over. And so the point is that the principle of mathematical induction can still be used, but the base case that you will need to prove is then going to be s of b. The second thing that can happen that sometimes throws people off is that in some problems, depending on the nature of the statement s of n, you may actually need to establish more base cases to get the inductive step to work the way that you want. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but maybe, for example, when you're trying to prove s of n, 
you need to know something about s of n minus one and s of n minus two. Well, in a situation like that, when you're establishing your base cases, you're probably going to end up having to prove that both s of one and s of two are true. That way in your inductive step, you can take advantage of the recursion that I mentioned. Anyway, it's quite often that you see situations like this where you have to establish a few base cases in order to get the inductive step to work. Another possible modification of the general pattern that I showed you is this. When you're working on the inductive step, instead of assuming as your inductive hypothesis that s of n is true, it's actually okay to assume that s of m is true for all m's from one to n. The second assumption here is what's called the strong inductive hypothesis. And the assumption on the top is what's called the weak inductive hypothesis. Now, although it looks like you're assuming a lot more when you're using the strong inductive hypothesis, it turns out that any statement that could be proved by using the strong inductive hypothesis could also be proved by using the weak inductive hypothesis. That means that you can assume the strong inductive hypothesis for free if you want. And in many cases, it may actually help to simplify the exposition of your proof. Next, let's talk about the well-ordering principle. Suppose that we have a subset A of the natural numbers. The well-ordering principle is the statement that if A is not the empty set, then there exists an element N in A such that for every m in A, m is bigger than or equal to n. To put it a little more succinctly, the well-ordering principle is the statement that every non-empty subset of the natural numbers has a smallest element. Now, I think that this is something that we all believe is true without proof, but it turns out that it's actually possible to derive the well-ordering principle from the principle of mathematical induction instead of simply assuming that it's true. This is a good exercise in proof writing, so I'd like to go through the argument really quickly. We're supposing that A is a subset of the natural numbers, and we're trying to prove the conditional statement. If A is not the empty set, then there exists an N in A, such that for every M in A, M is bigger than or equal to N. Let's start by looking at the contrapositive of this conditional statement. The contrapositive, remember, is simply the statement that if the negation of the second part of the conditional statement is true, then the negation of the first part of the conditional statement is true. We know from our video about logical statements that a conditional statement and its contrapositive are logically equivalent. So if we prove that the contrapositive statement is true, that will establish the well-ordering principle. Also from our video about logical statements, we know how to rewrite the negation of the existential statement on the left as a universal statement. Doing this, the statement on the left becomes the universal statement for every n in a, there exists an m in a such that m is less than n. We're trying to prove that if the statement on the left is true, then the statement on the right is true. So let's suppose that the statement on the left is true. And for every integer n in n, let's let s of n be the statement that n is not an element of a. We're trying to show that a is the empty set. And to do that is the same as proving that n is not an element of a for any n in n. In other words, to show that a is the empty set is the same as showing that for every n in n, the statement s of n is true. That's something that we can do by using the principle of mathematical induction. So to sum up where we are so far, we're trying to prove the contrapositive of our original conditional statement. That means that we can suppose that the universal statement on the left here is true, and we want to prove using mathematical induction that for every n in n, the statement s of n that n is not an element of a is a true statement. Let's start by proving the base case. In the base case here, we want to show that s of one is true which is the same as saying that one is not an element of the set A. Let's argue by contradiction and think about what would happen if one were an element of the set A. Well, if one were an element of the set A, then by our assumption that the universal statement on the left here is true, it would mean that there's an integer, m in A, which is strictly less than one. But the problem with that is that the set A is a subset of the natural numbers, and there are no natural numbers less than one. So this is impossible. Since we reached a contradiction, it means that our original assumption that one is an element of A is not correct. Therefore, one is not an element of A, which means that S of one is a true statement. That establishes the base case. For the inductive step of our argument, suppose that N is an integer N, and let's assume the strong inductive hypothesis that S of M is true for all integers M from one to N. Remember, we have nothing to lose by assuming the strong inductive hypothesis, and it's actually going to help make the proof shorter here. Well, the assumption that s of m is true for all integers m from 1 to n 
It's just the statement that for every m from 1 to n, m is not an element of A. What we now want to prove is that under the strong inductive hypothesis, the statement s of n plus 1 is true. Let's again argue by way of contradiction. If s of n plus 1 were false, that would mean that n plus 1 was an element of the set A. Well then, by our assumption that the universal statement on the left here is true, that would mean that there exists an integer m which is less than n plus 1 with the property that m is an element of A. Again, using the fact that A is a subset of the natural numbers, that would force this integer m to be an integer from 1 to n, but that contradicts the strong inductive hypothesis. Therefore, our original assumption that n plus 1 is an element of A must be false, which is the same as saying that s of n plus 1 is true. That completes the inductive step of the argument, and it allows us to conclude, based on the principle of mathematical induction, that the statement s of n is true for all natural numbers n. Remember, that's the same as saying that a is the empty set, so it establishes the contrapositive of the original statement of the well-ordering principle, and therefore completes the proof. As with the principle of mathematical induction, there are a couple of obvious possible modifications when we're trying to apply the well-ordering principle. First of all, instead of assuming that A is a non-empty subset of the natural numbers, we could just assume that A is a non-empty subset of the integers, which is bounded below, say, by some real number x. Then, by essentially the same argument, we could still conclude, just as before, that the set A has to have a smallest element. Another kind of obvious modification, if A is a non-empty subset of the integers, which is bounded from above by some real number x, then again, a simple modification of the argument that we gave would allow us to conclude that A has a largest element. This is also sometimes useful in practice. The next thing that I want to talk about is what's called the division algorithm. Now, there's a reason why it's called the division algorithm, because it's a fact that you use again and again when you're doing long division. But the division algorithm, in the sense that I'm presenting it here, is not actually an algorithm, like the kind of thing that you would feed into a computer. It's more like a lemma, and it's one that I think that most people have used hundreds of times without ever questioning it. What the division algorithm says is if A and B are integers, and B is non-zero, then there exist unique integers Q and R with the properties that A is QB plus R, and R is bigger than or equal to zero and less than the absolute value of B. Of course, this Q and R are just what you would call the quotient and remainder when you're dividing A by B. Now, I don't think this fact is surprising to anybody, but how do you know that it's actually true? I mean, that would be pretty shocking if one day you were dividing two non-zero integers and you found an example where you just couldn't get the remainder to fall into the right bounds. Or maybe you found an example where there were two different ways of writing A as Q times B plus R with R in this range. I think we all intuitively know that that's not going to happen, but the formal proof rests in a subtle way on the well-ordering principle. I'd like to look at the proof, but I'd like to focus just on the existence of these integers Q and R. The fact that the Q and R in the division algorithm are unique is also very important, but right now let's just talk about why they even exist. For simplicity, let's assume that B is bigger than zero. Remember, B is a non-zero integer, so it's either bigger or less than zero. And the proof that we're about to see with b bigger than zero will also work with b less than zero with very minor modifications. So suppose that b is bigger than zero and consider the set a consisting of all integers n with the property that a minus n b is bigger than or equal to zero. Think about the n's in this set as the possible choices for the q's in the division algorithm. Then the quantities a minus n b are going to be the possible choices for the remainders. We're already enforcing the conditions that the remainders are bigger than or equal to zero. And so in order to find the smallest possible choice of a remainder subject to that condition, we want to take n to be as large as possible. If you think about it, if n is the largest element of this set, then if a minus n b happened to be bigger than or equal to b, it would then mean that n plus one was an element of that set, which would be a contradiction. If you don't see that right away, don't worry because I'm going to work it out in just a minute. But first of all, there's a more fundamental consideration here, which is how do we know that this set even has a largest element? For that, we need to use the well-ordering principle. Remember that in order to apply the well-ordering principle to conclude that this set has a largest element, we need to show two things. First of all, we need to show that A is not the empty set. 
and we shouldn't take that for granted. That actually turns out to be the only tricky part of this argument. Secondly, rearranging the condition that a minus nb is bigger than or equal to zero gives that n is less than or equal to a over b. That means the elements of the set are bounded above. Well, how do we know that the set is non-empty? Here, let's divide the consideration into two cases. If the integer a happens to be bigger than or equal to zero, then I can take n to be zero. And since a minus zero b is a, which is bigger than or equal to zero, I conclude that zero is an element of a, so a is not empty. The other case is if a is less than zero. If a is less than zero, the same argument from before doesn't apply. But here I can take n to be a. a minus ab is a times one minus b. Since I'm assuming that b is an integer bigger than zero, one minus b is less than or equal to zero. And since a is negative, a times one minus b is bigger than or equal to zero. So this guarantees that the integer a is an element of the set a. In either case, I have that the set a is not empty. So I can conclude by one of the modifications of the well-ordering principle that I mentioned that the set a has a largest element. Let's call that largest element q, so that q has the property that for every integer n in a, n is less than or equal to q. Now that we have this largest element q, let's let r be a minus qb. What we want to show is that r is bigger than or equal to zero and less than b. The first of those inequalities is pretty easy because the fact that q is an element of a guarantees that a minus q times b is bigger than or equal to zero. So that means that r is bigger than or equal to zero. Now to show that r is less than b, let's proceed again by contradiction. Suppose that r were bigger than or equal to b and consider the quantity a minus q plus one times b. Rearranging the terms here, this is equal to a minus qb minus b, which is r minus b. But since we're assuming that r is bigger than or equal to b, the quantity on the right-hand side here is bigger than or equal to zero. But if a minus q plus one times b is bigger than or equal to zero, then that qualifies q plus one to be an element of the set a. That's a contradiction because we assume that q was the largest element of the set a. And since we've arrived at a contradiction, we know our original assumption that r is bigger than or equal to b is false. Therefore, we conclude that r is in fact less than b. That proves that there exist integers q and r, which satisfy the two parts of the equation in the division algorithm. Now, like I said before, there's only one pair of integers that does that, and that also needs a proof, but we'll save that for another time. Next, I'm gonna talk about divisors, GCDs, and LCMs. And I think this part is going to be familiar, so I'm gonna go kind of quickly through some of the definitions. If a and d are integers and d is not equal to zero, we say that d divides a if there's an integer q with the property that a is q times d. The notation for this is to write d vertical bar a, and if d does not divide a, then the notation is the same, but with the vertical bar crossed out. Also, if d divides a, then we say that d is a divisor of a, and we say that a is a multiple of d. Now let me mention a couple of facts which give us the definitions of the greatest common divisor and least common multiple of two non-zero integers. Suppose that a and b are two non-zero integers. Fact number one is that there's a unique natural number d, which is called the greatest common divisor of a and b, which satisfies the following two properties. Property number one, d divides a and d divides b, which is to say that d is a common divisor of a and b, and property number two, if E is any other integer which is a common divisor of A and B, then E also has to divide D. This means that D is the greatest common divisor of A and B. Now the existence of the integer D here is not completely obvious, but we're not gonna stop to try to prove it. We're just going to take this as a fact. The notation that we're gonna use for the greatest common divisor is either GCD of A and B or just parentheses AB if there's no confusion with other notation that happens to be in play. Also, just for comparison, some people also refer to the greatest common divisor as the greatest common factor or the highest common factor. So don't be confused if you hear one of those other names for this object or if you see one of these other abbreviations somewhere in other mathematical texts. Our second fact is that given non-zero integers a and b, there exists a unique integer l called the least common multiple of a and b, which satisfies these two properties. The first property is that both a and b divide l which is to say that L is a common multiple of A and B. And the second property is that if M is any other integer which is a common multiple of A and B, then L must divide M. That is to say that L is the least common multiple of A and B. We'll use the notation LCM of A and B to denote the least common multiple of two non-zero integers. 
And I'll also mention that some people also use the name least common denominator when they're talking about the least common multiple, and they write it as LCD, but I prefer to stick to LCM. An important fact connecting the GCD and the LCM of two non-zero integers is that when you multiply them together, you get the absolute value of the product of the two integers. This does require a proof, and it's not difficult to see why this is true, for example, from the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, but since we haven't really gotten that far yet, let's just take this right now as a fact. As a special case of this fact, when the GCD of a and b is 1, in which case we say that a and b are relatively prime, then the least common multiple of a and b is just the absolute value of the product of a and b. Now I'm sure that this is all very familiar, but I'd like to ask you, if I give you two non-zero integers a and b, how could you actually compute their GCD? The first way, which is probably the way that they taught you in school, is to factor both of the integers a and b, and then gather together the highest powers of each prime that divide both a and b. That works great, especially for small numbers, but the problem is that when a and b are very large, there's no known fast algorithm for factoring them. If you don't believe me that this is a problem, I'll show you an example in a minute. A second way of computing the greatest common divisor of two numbers is to use what's called the Euclidean algorithm. This is a very fast method, and it's also important for other reasons, so it's something that you should probably know about. The basic observation which leads to the Euclidean algorithm is that if you have two non-zero integers a and b, and you write a as qb plus r, then the GCD of a and b is always the same as the GCD of b and r. To see why this is useful, let's suppose that I have two natural numbers a and b, and that a is bigger than b. The division algorithm tells me that I can always write a as qb plus r, where r is a non-negative integer which is strictly less than b. And then I can replace the a in the GCD calculation by r, which I know is smaller. Then I can apply the same observation to b and r, and I can keep going. As I continue to do this, it turns out that the pairs of numbers that I'm considering get smaller essentially exponentially. And so very soon, I will have reduced the problem to computing the GCD of two numbers which are potentially much smaller than the original numbers that I started with. I'll show you an example in just a minute, but right now, just to make sure you understand why this observation is true, the fact that the GCD of a and b divides both a and b means that it divides a minus qb, but a minus qb is r. Therefore, since the GCD divides b and it divides r, the GCD of a and b must divide the GCD of b and r. Playing the same game the other way, the fact that the GCD of b and r divides b and r guarantees that it divides qb plus r, but qb plus r is a. Therefore, since the GCD of b and r divides b and divides a, it must divide the GCD of a and b. Now, if I have two positive integers and one divides the other and the other way around, then the two integers must be equal to each other. So that shows that the GCD of a and b is the GCD of b and r. Now that we've established that observation, let's take a look at the Euclidean algorithm. Suppose that we have two non-zero integers a and b and use the division algorithm to write a as q1 times b plus r1, where q1 is an integer and where r1 is bigger than or equal to zero and less than the absolute value of b. Then we know from our observation that the GCD of a and b is equal to the GCD of b and r1, and if that turns out to be easier to compute, then fine. But we can also keep going and write b as a multiple of r1 plus a remainder, where now the remainder r2 is bigger than or equal to zero and less than r1. Then applying the observation to the second equation here gives that the GCD of b and r1 is the same as the GCD of r1 and r2. Notice that at this point, both of the integers r1 and r2 are guaranteed to be smaller than the absolute value of b. Now we can continue in this way, obtaining smaller and smaller remainders at each step, but eventually, since the remainders are a decreasing sequence of integers, we're going to have to get to one that actually is zero. Once we do that, the algorithm stops. But tracing our observation all the way down the line, at that point we will have shown that the GCD of a and b is the same as the GCD of rn and rn plus 1, and since in the last equation here rn plus 1 actually divides rn, we can just read off the GCD as being rn plus 1. Now when I introduced the Euclidean algorithm, I said it's a fast algorithm. And if you're a person who's thinking about computational complexity, you may wonder how this can be fast, since a priori, the remainders could decrease very slowly. Well, for those of you who are wondering about that, I'll just mention that even though a remainder may decrease slowly from one step to the next, the remainders are guaranteed to decrease by at least a factor of two every two steps. That's something which is not difficult to show, and it guarantees that the Euclidean algorithm is a fast polynomial time algorithm for computing the GCD of a and b.
Okay, now for the fun part, let's do an actual example with numbers. I'd like to compute the GCD of these two numbers, but if there's anyone out there who really insists on factoring the numbers in order to compute their GCD, then I'd like to give you the option to pause the video now and compute the GCD of these two numbers by first factoring them. Anyway, when you're done, return here, and I'll show you how to do the problem using the Euclidean algorithm. To compute the GCD of these two numbers using the Euclidean algorithm, First, I'm going to write a as an integer multiple of b plus a remainder which is bigger than or equal to 0 and less than b. This is not difficult to do, and in this case it turns out that a is 1 times b plus 3,462. Well, now I'd like to continue, and I'd like to write b as an integer multiple of my remainder plus a second remainder. And here I find that b is 62 times r1 plus 577. Well, now I'm going to repeat the process and I'm going to write r1 as an integer multiple of r2 plus a remainder, but on the third step here, it turns out that the remainder is 0. Well, now I'm finished, and the Euclidean algorithm allows me to conclude that the GCD of the original two numbers is 577. Now, I'd like to mention that this problem is actually a lot more difficult to do by factorization, because in the prime factorizations of a and b, the smallest prime number is 373. So if you were trying to factor these numbers by checking all the prime numbers up to the square root, say, then you'd have to go pretty far before you actually found a prime factor. Like I said, in general, the Euclidean algorithm is a much faster algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor of two integers. Next, I'd like to talk about an important lemma called Bezu's lemma, which can be derived as a corollary of the fact that the Euclidean algorithm computes the GCD of a and b. To state Bezu's lemma, Let's suppose that a and b are non-zero integers, and let's write d for the GCD of a and b. If you consider an arbitrary number of the form a k plus b l, where k and l are integers, then since d divides a and b, it's going to also divide a k plus b l. Therefore, a k plus b l is going to be some number of the form q times d, where q is an integer. That's a pretty basic observation, but what Bezu's lemma says is that every integer multiple of d can be realized as a k plus b l for some integers k and l. In other words, the set of all integers of the form a k plus b l, where k and l run through the set of integers, is exactly the same as the set of all integer multiples of d. So in particular, taking q to be 1, Bezu's lemma guarantees that there exist integers k and l with the property that a k plus b l is equal to d. This is a very useful fact in many contexts, and in particular, it comes up in a lot of places in proofs in abstract algebra. Now, because we like to actually be able to compute things, we could also ask ourselves, given integers a and b, how do we find integers k and l so that a k plus b l is equal to d? Well, that's a question that we can answer by taking a closer look at the Euclidean algorithm. Here I'm going to show you how to find integers k and l so that a k plus b l is equal to the GCD of a and b. This explanation can also very easily be turned into a proof of Bezu's lemma. The first step is that you use the Euclidean algorithm, as we described before, to write a as a multiple of b plus a remainder, and then to write b as a multiple of r1 plus r2, and so on, and you keep going until you get a remainder of 0. Then you use what's called the reverse Euclidean algorithm to work your way back up, starting from the next to last step in the Euclidean algorithm. Not the last step, but the next to last step, and subsequently writing each of the remainders with biggest index at each step in terms of the remainders with the two smaller indices as you work your way up. To explain that a little more carefully, we start by writing Rn plus 1 as Rn minus 1 minus Qn plus 1 times Rn. Remember from the Euclidean algorithm, we know that Rn plus 1 is actually the GCD of A and B. You should remember that so that the conclusion at the end makes sense. Next, what we want to do is we want to use the previous step in the Euclidean algorithm to solve for Rn and then substitute it in to our equation for the GCD. When we do that, since Rn is Rn minus 2 minus Qn times Rn minus 1, we obtain an expression which, after factoring through, can be written as an integer multiple of rn minus 2 plus an integer multiple of rn minus 1. Now, I could say what those integers k1 and l1 are in terms of the q's here, but it's kind of a mess and there's no reason to do that. The important thing to know is just that they're two integers. 
Now the idea is that we just continue in this way, and at each step we use the previous step in the Euclidean algorithm to solve for the remainder with the biggest index in terms of the other two, and to substitute it back into our equation for the GCD. When we've worked our way back up to the second step in the Euclidean algorithm, we're going to have something that looks like an integer multiple of b plus an integer multiple of r1. And finally, when we solve for r1 in terms of a and b, and then substitute it back in, we're going to end up with an integer multiple of a plus an integer multiple of b. Those integers are exactly the k and l that we were looking for. So by running the Euclidean algorithm followed by the reverse Euclidean algorithm, we now have a fast way not only of computing the GCD, but of writing the GCD as an integer times a plus an integer times b. To make sure that we understand this, let's look at our example from before. When we ran the Euclidean algorithm with this choice of a and b, these are the steps that we obtained. But now let's suppose that we want to write the GCD 577 as an integer multiple of a plus an integer multiple of b. If you want to try to figure out how to do that by hand without using the reverse Euclidean algorithm, then you can go ahead and try, but it's a lot faster to use the reverse Euclidean algorithm because in this case, it's only going to take two extra steps. Remember, we start from the next to last step in the Euclidean algorithm and we use it to write the GCD as b minus 62 times 3462. Next, we use the previous step in the Euclidean algorithm to write 3462 as a minus b, and we substitute that in. And finally, we expand out this equation to conclude that the GCD of a and b is negative 62 times a plus 63 times b. That's really all there is to it. And believe me, this is something that's going to come up again later. The last thing that I want to talk about is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. If this were a course in elementary number theory, I would spend a lot of time talking about this. But since we're just trying to give an overview of basic properties of the integers, I'm just going to state the theorem and then mention some consequences. First of all, I hope everyone knows the definition of a prime number. A prime number is an integer p strictly greater than one, whose only positive divisors are one and p. And here's the statement of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic which I'm abbreviating here as FTAR, not to be confused with the fundamental theorem of algebra, can be stated by saying that any integer bigger than one has a unique prime factorization. And to make that precise, I'm assuming here that the primes P1 to PK are listed in increasing order and that the exponents are positive integers. If you try to write an integer bigger than one as a product of prime powers in this way, where the prime numbers are listed in increasing order, then there's one and only one way of doing so. That's the statement of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now we've been using this theorem since grade school and we've never really questioned it, but it does need a proof and the proof is not obvious. It also leads naturally into some good examples of why you shouldn't assume that certain things are obvious. There are some other rings, which are analogs of the integers, where the statement analogous to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic no longer holds. That's something that was overlooked by a lot of people when they started to study these rings, and it actually led to some famous mistakes in several big mathematical proofs. Anyway, the theorem is true for the integers, and that's all that we really want to know for now. Since we're assuming the truth of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, I want to list a couple of useful facts that follow right away. One is that if p is a prime number, a and b are integers, and p divides the product a times b, then p must divide a or p must divide b. This is an important property which characterizes prime numbers, and it's worth also pointing out that it's not true if p is not a prime number. In other words, if p were a number bigger than one which were not prime, then you could always find integers a and b, such that p divides a b, but p does not divide a, and p does not divide b. Finally, I want to mention how the GCD and LCM are related to the prime factorizations of positive integers. So let's suppose that a and b are two integers bigger than one, and let's write a as a product of prime powers of primes p1 to pl with exponents ai, and b as a product of prime powers of the same primes with exponents bi. Now the way that I've written this here, this is not exactly the same as the prime factorization that I showed you in the statement of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, because I'm allowing the possibility that some of these exponents could be zeros here. So I'm not claiming that these two representations are unique. I'm allowing some of the exponents to be zeros here to give me an easy way to concatenate the list of all primes that divide a or b. Anyway, after I've written a and b in this form, it's pretty easy to figure out what the greatest common divisor of a and b is. 
And all that you have to do is go through, take the highest power of each of these primes that divides both A and B. Well, the highest power of each of the primes that divides both A and B is going to be that prime to the smaller of the two exponents. So the GCD of A and B is going to be the product of the PIs to the power of min of AI and BI. There's a similar formula for the least common multiple, but since the least common multiple of A and B needs to actually be a multiple of both A and B, instead of taking the min of AI and BI, for each prime PI, you take the max of AI and BI. Taking the product I going from 1 to L gives you the least common multiple of A and B. These two formulas are less useful computationally than the Euclidean algorithm, but they are useful for other reasons in some proofs. Okay, well that's the end of this video. In the next video, we're going to finally get to the definition of what a group is, and we're going to look at some of our first examples of groups.